Right, welcome back everyone. So this is lecture 17 of CS229. The topics for today will be uh, to finish uh, the expectation maximization algorithm, we'll prove the convergence of expectation maximization algorithm, and then we'll apply it, uh, the expectation maximum uh, maximization algorithm to the Gaussian mixture model that we saw last um, in the last class. And then we'll move on to a new model uh, called the factor analysis and solve factor analysis again using expectation maximization. So that's the plan for today. And before we jump into today's topics, a quick recap of what we saw in the last class. So in the last class, we started off with unsupervised learning, right? And in unsupervised learning, we are given just um, data points, uh, a set of x's, and there is no supervision that comes along with it. What I mean is there's no y values that come along with the uh, corresponding x values. We're just given the x values. And we started off with clustering problems, right? Clustering problems are those where which we want to uh, identify some kind of a hidden structure where the data kind of clusters into different groups. The first algorithm that we saw was k-means. In k-means, we are given a collection of uh, examples, x's, and also, we, uh, Let's assume we are also given uh, the, no the number k of how many clusters we want to identify. And the way we go about um, executing k-means is to come up, uh, is to randomly initialize k different cluster means, where mu j refers to the jth cluster. There are k such mu j's. Each of those uh, cluster centroids, they are called centroids. They live in Rd, the same space where uh, x lives in. And then we loop until convergence where in step one, which you can think of as the E step, uh, we set the cluster identity CI of the ith element to be the identity of the jth um, uh, cluster centroid to which it is closest, to which it's nearest, right? So there are k different mu's, and for each i, we check which of the k mu's is nearest to it, we, where it's commonly we use the L2 distance, and depending on which one is the nearest, we use the argmin, so the, the identity of the cluster to which xi is nearest. We set that to be ci. And then what you can think of as the m step is for each of the cluster centroids, we only look at the examples which got assigned to that centroid in the previous e step and take the average of those x's to update our estimate of mu j. Right? It's this iterative algorithm where in one step we perform a cluster center assignment. So this is assignment where we assign each point to a centroid and then update the centroids using the mean of the assigned points. And we also uh, briefly discussed of how this overall algorithm can be thought of as coordinate descent on this loss function, which is also called the distortion function. So the distortion function takes two parameters, the, uh, it, the c's and the mu's, the set of all c's and the set of all mu's, and this loss function can be minimized using coordinate descent. By coordinate descent, what we mean is we hold some subset of the parameters fixed and optimize over the remaining uh, uh, subset of the parameters. And then we hold the remaining parameters fixed and optimize over the first uh, set of parameters and we go on and on, right? So uh, you can think of this step as optimizing over the C parameters while holding the mu's fixed. And this step as optimizing the mu parameters while holding the c's fixed, right? So that was k-means. And then we saw this other model called Gaussian mixture model. So Gaussian mixture model, we can uh, think of it as soft k-means. In Gaussian mixture model, we are again given k, the number of clusters or the number of uh, uh, mixtures, the Gaussian mixtures, uh, uh, that we want to uh, uh, fit. We are given the set of x's. We don't know the cluster identity. If this was supervised learning, then the cluster identities would be the yi's. And again here, if, supervised, if this was supervised learning, we would be given the ci's, which would be like the yi's. And we assume that the, gen the data generative model is something like this. There is, uh, uh, so we have a multinomial distribution which you can think of it as like the class prior. You know, what, what's the total number of examples in each given cluster? That you, you can think of that as a multinomial. And 
the zi's the cluster centroids uh, uh, the cluster identities of uh, every corresponding xi are sampled from this multinomial right and then once we know the zi's each for each identity of zi there is a corresponding mu and z right and the x's are sampled from the corresponding gaussian based on the value that z was sampled from so it's important to note that z in this case is discrete right because it is sampled from a multinomial we get we uh, z will happen to be one of the k different uh, 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 one of the k different uh, gaussian mixtures and by the choice of z there is an implicit mu and sigma associated with that gaussian and the x will be sampled from that gaussian right we think of this as the data generating distribution and so the parameters that uh, in this model are the phi mu and, and and sigmas in this case the parameters were was both the c ci and the mu i were the were the parameters so the parameters are in the green boxes right and then we came up with this with this uh, iterative algorithm again when we came up with this we were just using heuristics to make it something that is similar to k means we had not yet derived the em algorithm in its in its uh, uh, most general form and the, the algorithm that we came up was this so set so randomly initialize the parameters to some values just as in the case of k means and then we set uh, wi for each example right so this loop is over the number of examples for each examples we set wi to be pr the probability that uh, zi the, the probability that zi is the is the uh, uh, zi equals j given xi and and the uh, current uh, uh, current values of the parameters and then using these these uh, weights where uh, the weights is basically telling us what's the probability that um, um, xi corresponds to the jth uh, uh, cluster so the sum over j of all these wi's will be equal to 1 for every i and using these weights we perform what what we call as the m step which was to recalculate or update the values of the parameters using the uh, current estimates of the weights right and this again was very similar to what we did with k means right so the the red box think of it as the e step and the green boxes think of them as the m step right in the green boxes we are updating the uh, the parameter based on what we uh, uh, thought of uh, based on what we um, what we derived in the e step right in the in the uh, in the case of gaussians a mixture of gaussians each cluster centroid will be the weighted average of the xi's in k means it was just the average of the xi's which got assigned to that cluster but over here every uh, every example belongs to every cluster with different weights so this is just a weighted means of all the xi's and you know we have um, uh, corresponding uh, uh, parameter update rules for the phi's and, and and sigma j's and basically all of these uh, derivations was very similar to the case of gda gaussian discriminant analysis except you know we have a small a few small uh, uh, changes the changes are that each cluster centroid can have its own covariance rather than having a shared covariance and also that there there are k such uh, uh, clusters rather than just two Right? otherwise this is pretty much exactly the same as gda and then we moved on to deriving the the most general form of the em algorithm right in the em algorithm what we uh, wish to maximize is this marginal likelihood that's log p of x uh, uh, for a given value of theta right this is our likelihood objective had we observed the full data had we observed all the z's like in the case of uh, gda we would we would instead maximize p of x comma z theta if z was observed right but z is not observed so the 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 most rational thing to do is just to maximize the uh, uh, likelihood given the evidence that we have right so p of x is also called the evidence and we do some base some 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 pretty straightforward uh, algebraic manipulations so log p of x is the same as log of the uh, log of p of x z with z getting marginalized 
right that is by definition log p of x and then we kind of cook up an expectation out of out of nothing by multiplying and dividing it by some arbitrary uh, uh, distribution q over z and once we multiply it and divide it we can now think of this as an expectation right so we, we had a log and we cooked up an expectation out of nothing right and the the to think of the way we we come from this step to this step is described here so the expectation of some function g of z where z is uh, uh, is distributed according to q by definition is the sum over z q of z times g of z that's just the definition of expectation and in this case if we set g of z to be p of x z divided by q of z you know this becomes uh, the g function right? and therefore this is just the expectation by just the definition of uh, expectations right so we started with a log likelihood that's the that's the one that we always want to maximize and the log in the log likelihood is a concave function right and then we cooked up this expectation out of nothing by multiplying and dividing it by z so we got a concave function and an expectation using the two we apply jensen's inequality and jensen's inequality allows us to swap the order of the log and the expectation by using this inequality right so this is the the, the log likelihood the log in the log likelihood is the concave function the expectation is something that we cooked up out of thin air and jensen's inequality now allows us to swap this log and expectation and get this inequality right and this inequality we just gave it a name we call it elbow it's called the evidence lower bound because this is the evidence right and this is a lower bound of the evidence and the lower bound was obtained through jensen's inequality right and as a corollary we also saw that jensen's inequality tells us that this lower bound is exactly equal to if and only if q of z that is uh, the, the 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 probability distribution with which we were uh, taking uh, the expectation happens to be p of z given x well jensen's inequality did not tell us this but we derived it and showed that as a consequence q of z must be equal to uh, uh, p of z given x in order for this term to be a constant right now we we have this jensen's inequality and we have this corollary and using these two we then did, uh, came up with the the more general form of the em algorithm right in the most general form of the em algorithm we assume there is some parameter theta right in case of gaussian mixture model theta will be the collection of phi's mu's and sigma's right we are just calling it theta it could be any collection of para uh, it could be any parameter depending on the model that we have right and the most general form of the em algorithm is again iterative and in each iteration what we do is we perform the e step where the e step is basically calculating these optimum q distributions right the optimum q distribution what we saw here is the is the uh, uh, posterior distribution of uh, p uh, p of z given x right so in the e step we calculate the q distributions right and in the m step we maximize the elbow right and in the elbow by writing it out in in you know in a more um, um, verbose form the elbow is basically uh, what what we have over there it is the sum from uh, i equals 1 to n across all examples and this again is just the definition of the expectation right q of uh, of uh, z times log of p of x z theta over q of z a few things important things to note here is that in the e step for each example we calculate the posterior distribution and once we calculate that posterior distribution the q's are held fixed during the m step right that's a, that's a crucial detail right the q's over here are constant we assume these q's to be constant even though the q's had thetas in them we assume that these thetas are from the previous iteration and we held we hold them fixed during the m step right and when we are performing this argmax over theta the only theta that is getting optimized is the theta that shows up over here right so this is the you know p of x comma z divided by by q of z is you know, what we had over here that went into the elbow and it is only this theta that we are optimizing over in the m step right the q distribution remember it came from the from the e step 
and in the E step in order to calculate Q there was a Q over here but we do not write this as P of Z given X parameterized by theta because we are not optimizing that theta we are holding it fixed right and we are only optimizing the, the, the thetas that show up in this in the, in, in, the, in the numerator right and this gives us a, a visual understanding of the EM algorithm where the dotted black line is log P of X which we assume is, is hard, it could be hard to evaluate or it could be hard to, to optimize directly and we are going to uh, we are going to we are going to uh, assume that this is not directly accessible for optimization right. Instead what we do is we start with some random initialization theta some theta naught right and for this particular value of theta naught we construct the corresponding Q distribution as the posterior Z given X at that value of theta naught right and that gives us the corresponding elbow where the Q corresponds to uh, Q corresponds to the posterior at, at uh, uh, theta naught right and this theta naught by definition or by the corollary will be exactly equal to log P of X over here right. So we are at theta naught and by constructing the elbow and by evaluating the elbow we have effectively evaluate we, we know what value log P of X is at this uh, um, at this point. But now we want to keep improving our theta values or keep adjusting our theta values such that we the, the corresponding log P of X is increasing right that that is our goal that our objective is to find value of theta that maximizes log P of X and, and we are doing the CM algorithm to do that indirectly right. If we had observed Z we could have directly performed gradient ascent or gradient descent over this uh, objective. However we are doing this iterative algorithm where in each step we construct a lower bound using a specially chosen value of Q and that value of Q is the posterior distribution of Z given X at theta naught right and then we maximize the elbow instead of maximizing log P of X and when, when, when we maximize the elbow we get an updated value theta 1 and this theta 1 will correspond to uh, the elbow being maximized right and it is using this theta 1 we now construct a new elbow which is tight at, at, uh, uh, at theta 1 and this elbow has you know Q1 and Q1 will be the posterior evaluated at theta 1 right and that is the that is the elbow of the second iteration and then we locally and then we maximize elbow or locally maximize the elbow of the second iteration to get uh, you know theta 2 and using this theta 2 we can you know construct elbow 3 and so on and so on right. So it is this this uh, uh, iterative algorithm you know which we call as the EM algorithm and what we are going to do today will be to uh, give, give a, a quick and easy proof that proves that the EM algorithm always converges to a local optimum and then we are going to apply it to uh, the Gaussian mixture model and end up with the same update rules using this more principled approach of maximizing, um, uh, maximizing the elbow iteratively and then we will move on to factor analysis which is a different model, uh, another different uh, uh, latent variable model where there is a hidden Z and apply EM to the factor analysis model and solve that using EM as well. So that is the plan for today, any, any questions so far? Yes. So the question is what if you have like um, you are in a, in a if, I, if I summarize it correctly what if you are in a, in a streaming setting where you are getting new data um, um, you know and you already have a model that you fixed with the old data and you, you obtain some, some more new data if you are using uh, if you are performing uh, market segmentation and you have some customer data you fit a model and you got data from new customers right. Uh, so the, the um, uh, so what you want to do over there is first you want to ask the question do we want to hold on to the same number you know of cluster k or do we want to update k 
Right? That's the first question you want to ask when you get the new data. If the answer, uh, you know, if you want to hold on to the same cluster K, then you can perform EM algorithm where you can use the, the previously optimized parameter values as the starting uh, random initialization and then just refit over the whole data and you know, that hopefully will just converge faster. However, if you uh, decide to have you know, a larger K uh, where you want to have more number of clusters you know, with, with, the, uh, with the updated data, then you basically have to just start randomly. Yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. So, so the question is, uh, we fit the new models and, and we get new customer data. And how do we uh, uh, place them into, um, um, place them into one of the existing uh, um, uh, clusters? In case of k-means, that would be, you know, uh, pretty straightforward. In place of xi, you place the new x star, the, uh, uh, you know, the new customer uh, data that you get and find the, minim the closest centroid. In case of the uh, Gaussian mixture model, um, you will calculate this posterior distribution using the Bayes rule to get a, 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 you know, a probability distribution over your mixtures. Right? And, and that's, that's uh, essentially something very similar to what you did with GDA. In GDA, uh, it was only two classes and therefore it, was, it took a, a, a logistic regression form. In, in case of uh, your Gaussian mixture model, this will end up taking the form of a softmax Right? And because the covariances are different, it will effectively be softmax using quadratic features. Right? Good question. Was there another question? Yes, question. Is the general setting for the EM algorithm, so is that for each of the i, uh, x, so qi will basically put them in, in the v bin, so it's a uh, PDF over like what class it can belong to, so is it like for a discrete classification? Yeah, so the question is, you know, in the E step, are we calculating uh, a, a, a discrete uh, distribution over, you know, the set of Z, uh, set of K classes? Exactly, that's exactly what happens here. For each X, um, um, so what, what you want to do is equals J equals J, right? That's what you want, that's how you want to think of this, right? So Q is, is a multinomial distribution over the cl clusters. So Q in this case will, you know, Q of, z, you know, 3 for the third example. Once you calculate this, we'll give you a multinomial distribution over the k classes. So this is cluster 1 through cluster k, and you'll get some value 0 0.1, 0 0.9, 0 0.01, and so on. So what does that z3 mean? So z3 means like the third example. Oh, so like, you know, xi, you know, will have a zi corresponding to that. Right. Was there another question? Yeah, sir, I didn't get what you mean by uh, Oh yeah, so uh, the question is, wh wh what did I mean by quadratic features because we used uh, covariance? We discussed that briefly in uh, in GDA. It's it's not super critical that you understand that. What uh, what what? If you remember in GDA, what we uh, what we saw was, um, you know, if 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 your data resides in two clusters. Right? And we assume they have equal covariances, then the two covariances might look like this. And the separating hyperboundary will therefore be a straight line. Right? But if we assume different covariances, then it could be you know, a, a curved line. And the posterior of this is effectively represented by a, a logistic regression that uses quadratic features of x1 and x2. Right? So it's, it's essentially the same instead of two you will have you know k different centroids and because they're all having different covariances right we assume different covariances for each class that means uh, it's like uh, you're performing a softmax with quadratic features right so logistic the the generalization of, of the logistic function to k classes the softmax right and if you assume uh, um, equal equal covariance of the gaussians then you will get effectively get a softmax uh, using linear features, and if you include uh, 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 different covariances, it will effectively be uh, uh, softmax using quadratic features. But it's not super critical that you understand the, the connection to the uh, uh, softmax or the quadratic features. Yes, question. So just a quick question about why, why is it that R1 algo uh, settles the 
Exactly. So, so uh, the the fact that uh, so the question is um, the elbow touches log p of x over here. Is, does it touch because you know we intentionally, carefully constructed the elbow to be that way? And that's exactly right. We construct the elbow over here such that the q in the elbow is the posterior that makes it tight at at, at log p of x. Right. So let's move on. Uh, so. So the proof of, of why EM algorithm converges. Proof of EM convergence, right? So the, so the proof of EM convergence is something that we've almost seen uh, over here, right? So in order to prove that uh, EM converges, our strategy will be to show that uh, for every t or time step or every iteration, L theta of t plus 1 is greater than or equal to L theta of t. Okay. So L over here is our objective that we want to uh, uh, optimize. So L theta is, act, is log p of x theta. And what we want to show is by, by performing the EM algorithm by iteration after iteration, the log likelihood of, uh, of, of uh, the marginal log likelihood of p of x is always increasing with each iteration of EM algorithm. That's what we want to show. Right? And by showing this uh, and also by recognizing the fact that the log likelihood is, is bounded above, so log likelihood cannot go off to you know, infinity. Using those two uh, assumptions, we will, um, we will make the case that because L is bounded above and because with every iteration we are um, increasing um, the value of L, eventually we will converge. And so what remains is to, is to show uh, this, this condition. And to show this condition, we will basically use the same reasoning that we saw with the uh, diagrams over here, right? So um, L theta t plus 1 right, is greater than or equal to elbow of x q t Theta t plus one. Why is this the case? So L theta. This is uh, uh, this is basically just the uh, uh, definition of of uh, what, what Jensen's inequality gave gave us that the uh, uh, log likelihood for for the same values of theta, the the likelihood p of x will always be greater than or equal to the elbow for any values of of, of q. And this is greater than or equal to elbow of x t and theta t. Right. So this was Jensen's inequality. Why is this the case? Exactly. This this is because because of the M step, right? The, so the M step guarantees that um, that theta t plus one was chosen to be the maximizer of of this. So so theta t plus one over here will give us the the highest value for for elbow, and therefore this is due to M step. Because we had the uh, uh, theta t plus one was chosen to be the arg max of the, of uh, of this, okay. and then um, and 
and this is equal to L theta of t. And why is this the case? Right. This is the corollary of Jensen's inequality. So, what is this basically telling us? So, to kind of visualize, uh, to visually understand this proof, L theta of t plus 1, so this black dot over here, right, this is L theta of 1, right, assume t equals 0, right, L theta of 1, it says is greater than equal to the elbow, right, it is always greater than the elbow, so the elbow evaluates to a point here. Right, this is greater than 0 is step 1 right? and step 2 basically told us elbow evaluated at theta t plus 1 is greater than elbow evaluated at theta t. So, that tells us that this is greater than 0 that is step 2 of the inequality right? because theta, theta 1 was chosen to maximize the blue curve. And then step 3 tells us that, that L theta equals the elbow and, and that is because we, we constructed, we intentionally constructed the blue elbow to be equal to log P of, of x at, uh, at the current value of, uh, at, at, at theta t. Right? So, that basically tells us the gap between the, 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 gap between the, 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 the blue line and the black line at this is is basically 0. Right? So, that tells us that L of theta 0 is less than L of theta 1. Right? It, it, so, so, at each step we are guaranteed not to get worse in terms of the uh, log likelihood. Yes, question? So once we so so um, so the question is should this be Q T minus one? So I'm saying uh, L theta of T uh, will be elbow of X semicolon X Q T minus one comma theta T. So L theta of T will be equal to elbow where Q is evaluated at the posterior of theta. Right? Yes. So that is, that is, so that is, that is theta T. So, this is the E step, we get this from the E step, yeah. So, that happens in, and the next step is getting the theta for that. For so, the next step, yeah, for, so, so, E step, so, at the current value of theta, we use the E step to calculate Q of T and using Q of T, we construct the elbow and that elbow will be equal, right. And then from this elbow, so, th this is basically like starting at theta naught in the picture and constructing the blue elbow. Right, so, the blue elbow will be equal to this and the, the next step is to go from theta t to theta t plus 1 by optimizing the blue elbow. So, L theta of t is has no q, right? L theta of t is just L theta of t. L theta of t is just log p of x, there is no q in it. Right? Is this, is this, is this clear? Any questions? So it's so, so so the proof here turns out to be pretty intuitive. Uh, you know, it, it 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 can be easily visualized. What we are saying is, we start at any value of of uh, of theta, some random value of theta, right? The uh, log likelihood has uh, you know um, evaluates to some value, which we may or may not be able to calculate, right? But we can always construct an elbow such that log p of x equals to that elbow at that point, right? So we construct the elbow. It is guaranteed to be lower than then uh, log p of x and then we optimize the elbow right so what, once we optimize the elbow we reach a higher point at the elbow now it is important that this point over here was tight what would happen if this point was not tight what would happen if the elbow was not tight over here this question 
Right. So what would happen if um, if if this was not guaranteed to be tight is that it may well have been the case that the likelihood function goes like this. And if this was not tight, we may have gone down in our likelihood rather than guaranteed to be going up. Right? I, it, because this was tight at, at, at Q naught, because it was tight, we you know the, the other two pieces of the proof allow us to connect L theta of uh, L of theta 1 to be greater than L of theta of, of 0. If this were not to be tight, then the likelihood at, at theta naught could have been much higher and we may have actually gone worse in terms of our uh, optimizing our objective. Is that clear? Cool. All right, so now we have derived the, the most general form of the EM algorithm. Here, uh, Zs and Xs could be anything. And the, the joint probability or the model, we made no assumption of the uh, joint probability of P of X and Z to take any specific form. Right? And now we will taking this you know, more generic algorithm, we will see how we can ap apply it to the Gaussian mixture model and, and uh, basically see that we will end up with the same update rules. This part will be super quick. Uh, I'll just give some 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 hints on how to go about it. And in your homework, you'll be basically doing a more detailed version of uh, what we'll be doing now. So to derive uh, so G Gaussian mixture model via EM, right? So for the uh, Gaussian mixture model via EM. First, we do the E step. Right, so in the E step, for each i. Right, so be before we we uh, before we go into uh, how we go about doing it, uh, a general kind of uh, template or you know thumbs of rules to follow when you want to apply EM is to first always uh, get clarity on what the model is. Right, first. Step one, right? Write out P of x comma z. And what I mean by write out is write out your assumptions, right? You may observe only x's and z's. That is fine. We may only observe x's and not z's. Independent of what your what data you observe and what you don't observe, first write out your model. And by writing out your model, it may be something like this, you know, z comes from multinomial, right, and then x given z comes from normal uh, of mu z and sigma z. Why do we call this the model? Because this is effectively p of z times p of x given z, and this is equal to p of x comma z. Right. So first write out your model and writing it in this form is, is basically called as writing the data generative process and writing the data generative process, you're implicitly defining what the model is. Right? So the first thing you want to always do is write out the model and be clear what the data generating process is and what your parameters are. Right? And in this case, the parameters basically uh, are P of X comma Z, the parameters will be phi, mu's and sigma's. Right. Be clear on what the parameters are and what the what's the form of the full model. And then the step two is clearly identify what are latent and what are observed, or you know what's the evidence. 
and, and, and in most of the uh, models that we will see, x will generally be the evidence, that is the part of the data that is observed and z will be latent. That is how we generally name the things. So, when you, when you, uh, when you look at the models uh, in, in the notes or uh, in general, you know, x will generally refer to something that is observed that will be given to us and z will generally refer to, you know, some latent variable that is not observed, right. And, uh, okay. and then once, once you are clear about what the full model is, what the parameters are, what is observed and what is latent, you know, only then attempt to apply EM on it, right. If you are not clear of, of you know, what, what, you know, if you are not clear about these first two steps, it is going to be very hard to apply EM and you are going to just get confused really badly, right. Always be clear on what the full model is, the data generating process which is the same as the model, what the parameters are, what is observed and what is latent, right. In case of the Gaussian mixture model, the, the Zs, the latent variables are the cluster identities, right. The parameters are the, uh, uh, the, uh, the multinomial parameters, the, the different sets of mu's and sigmas, right. Those are the parameters in Gaussian mixture model and what is observed are just the x's without the cluster identity, right? There is also a difference between, um, you know, an, an, another thing to be clear about is there are two kinds of unknowns here, right. So we have the unknown latent variables and the unknown parameters. What is the difference between the two? The unknown latent variables are example specific, right. For a different choice of x, you will have a different latent variable. Whereas the unknown parameters are global, right? they, they are not specific to any example. The means and the covariances and the, and the uh, parameters of the multinomial, they are kind of global in the sense that they do not belong to any specific example. Whereas the latent variables are paired with a given example, right. And, uh, and, and, and this kind of a, a model, you can think of it as a frequentist model, where we, we consider the parameters to be unknown constants, whereas, but you can also perform a Bayesian treatment of this, where you consider everything to be a random variable, but you know, that is beyond the scope. For the EM algorithm, it is, it is clear that it is important that you are clear what the, what the parameters are, and the parameters are global, they, they are not specific to any example. And there is this other kind of unknown, which is the latent variable, which is paired with an example. And what we do in the E step is basically estimate this latent variable that is paired with each example, right. Which is why in the E step, we loop over each i, okay. You are calculating what the corresponding hidden latent variable is for this, uh, for the given example by holding the parameters fixed. Right? And in the M step, we go the other way. We assume we, you know, you know, the Z values are, you know, the Z values, um, 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 what they are, and then we go about updating the parameters in the M step. Right? So in the E step, we are we are kind of attacking one kind of unobserved, which is specific to each example, and in the M step, we are attacking the other kind of unknown, which is global. And this is going to be common in all kinds of models where you are applying EM, right. In the E step, we are attacking the latent variable, in the M step, we are attacking the parameters, right. So, so the E step in Gaussian mixture model will, is basically for each I, right, for each I, QI z i equals j is equal to p of z i given x i at the current values of phi mu sigma. Now, how do we write, how do we obtain the posterior distribution of z given x using Bayes rule exactly. And this is p of x given z times p of z over p of x, right. And again this, because z is discrete, this will be p of x given z times p of z over 
summation over all z p of x given z times p of z right and this turns out to be p of x given z what is p of x given z here p of x given z is a is a normal distribution right and and p of x given z will therefore be uh, 1 over square root 2 pi to the or 2 pi to the d by 2 this is just I am just writing out the uh, uh, the uh, multivariate Gaussian you know sigma j to the 1 by 2 that is the, the determinant times the exponent we have uh, x i minus mu j transpose sigma j inverse x i minus mu j and in times times p of z p of z is just phi because it's you know phi j and and uh, because it's it's uh, you know everywhere it's implicit that we are trying to do is equal to j so this is just phi j now here sum over all j you know the same thing this question should there be yeah yeah there's a minus sign yeah thank you minus 1 over 2 right so uh, we've done such calculations before right we we uh, calculated such posteriors in gda and we also saw that if the uh, if p of x given c belongs to the exponential family there's going to be an exponent here right and then there are all these constants they can get absorbed into the exponent you can take the log of this take it in and you get you know exponent of something divided by exponent of something plus exponent of something plus exponent of something that works out to be the softmax uh, comes out to be in the softmax form right and yeah so this is basically you know you know all the values here plug it in and you get uh, uh, you, you get the estimates for 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 the e step right? so that's the e step and I'm going to erase this. Uh, hopefully, you've taken note of this, right? And in the m step, now in the m step, m step, what we want to do is mu sigma phi is equal to Org max of mu sigma phi, right? And in the m step, we do the org max over the uh, the elbow exactly. And the elbow can be written as what we saw over here. So the uh, elbow we have written out the the uh, expanded version there. And for simplicity, let's just call this w i j. We call it wij because once we calculate it, this will be held constant in the m step, right? Even though wij depended on the values of theta of the uh, parameters to get calculated, in the m step, we will not be optimizing over them. We're going to hold them fixed, right? And because that's that's for the 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 uh, uh, um, the elbow should be held fixed, and uh, we're going to arg max over the elbow expression here and that will be sum over i equals 1 to n sum over z w i j or here we can write like j equals 1 to k w i j of so the elbow is so the elbow is basically the expectation of the log of this term right it will be log p of x i z i 
given theta mu sigma and phi divided by w i j right this is just writing out the elbow by expanding out the expectations right and this arg max mu sigma phi i equals 1 to n j equals 1 to k w i j now this we can again break down the joint according to our data generating process so this will be p of x given z or z i equals k or z i equals j times p of z i equals j over w i j. Now again the same process that we did over here p of x given z will be a multivariate Gaussian PDF, p of z given j is, is the multinomial which will be just phi of j right and w's the two w's are constants for this for the m step the two w's are constant in the e step we derive them using the previous values of theta or the previous values of, of the parameters but once we calculate them in the e step we will hold we will hold them frozen in the m step for performing the maximization right so plug in the values of, of the Gaussian PDF here plug in phi j here and to perform arg max, how do we perform arg max? Take the gradient, set it equal to zero, solve for the parameters. Right? It just looks pretty, you know, big and nasty, but you know, it's pretty straightforward. There, there's no, there's no um, uh, uh, special tricks going on here. It's just tedious. Right? So write out the uh, uh, write out the uh, Gaussian PDF here, phi j here. Take the derivatives, set it equal to zero, and once you do that for separately for phi mu and j, we will end up getting phi is equal to um, 1 over n i equals 1 to n w i j and mu hat will be basically the same thing. Um, so basically this will be mu hat and sigma hat will be you know this thing right so write it out like this take the gradient set it equal to 0 and we get this right and this is the way we start from the general em algorithm you know work out the e step and the m step and in the m step work out the maximization and by following this principled approach we will see that we will end up with the same update rules that we get by you know that we obtain using the uh, the heuristic soft k means kind of an argument. Next question. Exactly. So the question is do we have k different mu's and k different sigmas? Yes. So over here, when I write mu, I mean the collection of k different mu vectors and k different you know, covariance matrices. So in the M step, are you simultaneously updating all of those? Yeah. So in the M step, we simultaneously update all of those. Exactly. Yeah. You can do it for any mu j or sigma j, and you know it's symmetric. So once you do it for one, it's the same pr procedure for doing uh, updating all the others. Good question. Okay. So that's that's uh, EM and EM applied to uh, Gaussian mixture models. Okay. So what we did basically was to was to come up with a general EM algorithm, and using the general EM algorithm, first. Uh, in order to apply it to Gaussian mixture model, the first thing we had to do was get clarity on what the model was, what's the full joint probability distribution of, of, all the, of all the variables, x's and z's, have clarity on what the model parameters are. In case of uh, Gaussian mixture model, it was phi, collection of mu's, collection of covariance matrices, sigmas, right? And then get clarity on what's observed and what's not observed. Once you know what's observed and what's not observed, it becomes clear what you need to do in the E step. In the E step, we need to calculate the posterior, the probability of unobserved given the observed, whatever it is for your specific model. Construct the, construct the uh, uh, E step of probability of unobserved given the observed, 
and we hold the parameters fixed, right? And the, the steps of evaluating this will be different for different models. For Gaussian mixture models, this happened to be normal and multinomial. For a different model in factor analysis that we are going to see next, these might be different, right? But the, but the general recipe is the same. Construct the, <coughs> construct the uh, posterior distribution or the, uh, uh, in the E step. And then in the M step, write out the elbow, right? Write out the elbow by plugging in the full model in the numerator and uh, uh, and the uh, the the posterior the Q distributions in the in the denominator and in the expectation, the denominator and the the probability with which we are taking the expectation are constant in the M step. Right? We are going to hold them constant, and by holding them constant, we are going to optimize over these set of parameters. Right? When we do the arg max, it is only these parameters that we are updating. There are you know, kind of hidden parameters inside these that were used in the in the E step, but we are not going to optimize them. For, for, for the purpose of the M step, the Q distributions are fixed, right? We are going to only optimize over these, and when we take the gradient, everything except these will be assumed to be constant, right? And basically, you know, this is just calculus, you know, take the gradient, set them equal to zero, and we end up with the update rules that is specific to your model and what was observed and what was not observed. Any questions? Yes. Oh, because so so the question is why are we summing over J? Because in only in K means we do uh, we assign it to only one point. In 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 um, in case of the Gaussian mixture model, we we every point belong to every cluster with different weights. Yeah, but why why do that? Like why not have it be belong to either of the Gaussian? So this what we got here was purely a consequence of applying the EM algorithm. And the EM algorithm we we proved that it will you know converge and it will maximize. So. The, the choice of summing over here was not an arbitrary choice. It's just a consequence of the EM algorithm. Yes, question? So the question is, instead of taking the expectation uh, what if in, instead we took the mode and you know take the the, the highest uh, highest probability? In that case, we will re, uh, the Gaussian mixture models will 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 be kind of modified into becoming k-means. In that case, all right. So factor analysis. So factor analysis probably has the most tedious calculus in all this course. So there's going to be quite a lot of symbols that's, that are going to come up on the board. But even though the, the, uh, the expressions might look complex and hard, the idea is pretty simple. Factor analysis. So, in factor analysis, we consider an interesting and challenging scenario. So, in factor analysis, right, we have xi belonging to some Rd. And we are given a collection xi i equals 1 to n. And now we are interested in this in this kind of um, uh, situation where d is much bigger than n. 
right. In most of the, most of the uh, uh, common scenarios that we encounter, the number of examples that we, that we have will generally be, be much bigger than the dimension of the data. But there can be situations where the dimension of the data is much bigger than the number of examples that we have, right. And it is, it is challenging because when we, uh, using this, if we, if we uh, assume this came from some kind of a Gaussian distribution, and if we estimate the covariance matrix sigma, sigma will now be 1 over n, sum over i equals 1 to n, xi minus mu, xi minus mu transpose, right. So each of this, each, each term inside the sum is, is 1 rank 1 matrix, and you are summing over n rank 1 matrices. So sigma will be rank n, but n is much smaller than d, right. Sigma is a d by d matrix, but it is only rank n, right. And now if you want to uh, use this covariance matrix to, to uh, calculate your Gaussian PDF, right, your Gaussian PDF is P of x given mu sigma 1 over 2 pi to the d by 2. So the determinant over here will be zero because it is it is it is it's not full rank, right? And and because you get you get a, a zero in the denominator, you know you can't even evaluate the the uh, evaluate the PDF, right? And and uh, the question is now, what do we do in such scenarios? Yes, was there a question? I'm sorry. This will be rank n because we are summing over n rank one matrices. Matrix is d by d, sigma is d by d, right, but it will have only rank n. And most of the times when n is bigger than d, it will be rank d, right. But in, in cases where n is much smaller than d, uh, you know, the, the rank will be, so, so this will be a singular matrix and, you know, we, we, we can't do much with it. Yes, question? Uh, I, I wouldn't say so. I, I, I'll come to that. So we, we are now just considering a scenario where x's are coming from a high dimensional space and um, and, and uh, the number of dimensions is much greater than the number of um, uh, the number of dimension is much greater than the number of examples we have. right? We can think of kind of you know, a few ways in which we can kind of address this. So one way is, you know, instead of thinking, uh, instead of considering sigma to be, you know, a full-blown covariance matrix, maybe we can restrict sigma to be just the diagonal matrix so that the number of parameters reduce. But even if you limit it to a diagonal matrix, the number of, of diagonal values is still d that's greater than n. We could also think of um, um, sigma thinking of um, restricting sigma to be some kind of a scalar times the identity matrix. But if we do this, then we are effectively limiting ourselves to covariances that are spherical, right? And that may not capture all the interesting um, 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 structure in your data. So this wouldn't be very interesting either. So instead, what we want to now, um, now do in, in, uh, with, with uh, factor analysis is to think of a latent variable z. So assume that your data, the true data that, uh, so, so we are observing x's, but we are going to assume that these x's live on some kind of a lower dimensional subspace. Right? So we are going to assume that there is a z i that is normally distributed. Right? And then we are going to make this second assumption uh, that Right, so over here, i is i is basically k-dimensional, and z i is therefore r k. So we're going to assume that there is this lower k-dimensional subspace in which these reside, right? And from these, from this k-dimensional subspace. 
we are now so x given z is now a normal distribution with mean mu plus so in the in, in the notes uh, they use capital lambda right to to denote the um, um, the uh, uh, up mapping matrix i personally don't like greek letters there's nothing against greeks but i'm just going to call it l because you know it it looks less scary right so there is a, a, a matrix l times z and a covariance psi right let's leave one greek one more greek in there no problem right so here l is a matrix that maps us from k to d d by k right and you can assume psi is are there any greeks here what's the right way to pronounce this is it psi or psi anybody knows psi psi all right so we'll call it psi so uh, psi is d by d and we're going to assume it is diagonal right so what's happening here we're going to assume that there is this low dimensional or k dimensional subspace where k you will assume is less than n the number of examples that we have right and there are these latent variables z's that reside in this k dimensional subspace which get mapped on to a higher dimensional space which is x's and the way it gets it gets mapped on is through this you know what what you can call as you know an uplifting matrix where uh, z's when you multiply it with l it takes you from k dimensional to so lz will be in d dimensions and there is uh, you know it gets shifted by uh, some some offset mu and some there is some random uh, noise that is that gets a uh, diagonal noise that uh, that gets added right so previously in gaussian mixture models you know to compare it to gaussian mixture models z's were multinomial in gaussian mixture models but now z is continuous here right x given z was in the gaussian mixture model was uh, normally distributed here also it's normally distributed except in the gaussian mixture model for each z because z was discrete we had a separate mu and and a sigma but over here we are not going to have a separate mu and, and a sigma but the 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 mean for x given z will be this term which is some parameter mu that's common across all examples plus the mapping of z from the lower from the k dimensional lower uh, subspace to d dimensional that's the higher dimensional subspace so l is this mapping that takes you from a low dimension to a high dimension this question what is what is z is, is z your uh, is you are not doing discrete classification so this so in factor analysis we have moved on from classification and here we are essentially trying to find a subspace of our of our of, of the x's that we have right x's live in a high dimensional subspace what we are trying to do is to find a low dimensional subspace in which they reside in which z reside in which z reside and the corresponding uh, and we assume that the uh, the 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 x's that we observe have a corresponding latent variable z and the way x is generated from its latent variable is through this relation but what is your goal exactly the goal here is to fit um, as with all Unsup, you know, probabilistic unsupervised models. The goal is to p of x. You know, theta. In this case, theta is you know mu, sigma, and and yeah, mu. So what do we have here? Mu, psi, and l. Right. And we want to find these mu, psi, and l such that we have we have. a probabilistic model or a density estimator over x's and it would you know there are many interesting um, uh, scenarios where this this uh, this can happen for example um you you can you know um 
the reasons, the, the, the kind of uh, scenarios where this can be useful is, supposing you have some kind of a, a temperature sensor, right? So you can have temperature sensors that are you know, spread across your building, right? And let's say there are um, D such sensors, right? And if you measure all your sensors at a particular time, that collection of observations can be your Xi's, right? So Xi belongs to Rd. So instead of I, you can think, think of it as T. At one time, you, measure, you, you take the you know, measurement of all your sensors, uh, temperature sensors in your entire building, and you get a D-dimensional, high-dimensional uh, subspace. But you know, all these, these uh, different uh, temperature uh, values may not be independent, which means you know, two temp uh, uh, temperature sensors inside this room are probably going to give you, you know, very similar values. Right? And uh, if, uh, similarly, if you have 10 different sensors here, maybe the, you, know, you might see, uh, see some uh, slight changes where you know, it might be closer to where the, the light bulbs are because of, you know, it's warmer and maybe colder in a few places, but more or less, you know, they're not independent. And there are these, um, these you know, similarly, if you, if you, you know, collect the set of all uh, temperature sensors in the entire building, there are probably a few factors that, that affect the different sensor readings across all the, you know, across all the sensors, right? And basically what we are trying to find out, uh, or what we are, uh, our goal here is to come up uh, with a model, you know, for P of X and, 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 and for example, uh, come up with a model for P of X to get a sense of what are normal sensor readings, right? And using this, you can probably build some kind of an anomaly detector to see if there is, you know, a fire going on somewhere, right? And the, the idea here is that even though X's reside in a much higher dimensional subspace, their values, the actual temperatures that they end up measuring are based on a few, much fewer factors, right? And these are, you know, that live in a K-dimensional subspace. The assumption here is that there are probably just K factors that decide the temperatures that you observe in all the D sensors. And, and, and you know, given these, these D-dimensional observations, we are trying to uh, build a model from which we can not only fit uh, P of X well, but also hopefully make inference about Z given X. Right? So it, it's, it's kind of dual purpose. Uh, in, in case of GM uh, Gaussian mixture models, these were discrete. You know where we were trying to cluster data, but here it's 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 a, it's a fundamentally different problem where we are trying to find subspaces in our data. So this is no longer uh, we are not, no longer doing the EM. Model. We will do EM on this, right? EM made no assumption about Z being discrete or or or, or um, uh, uh, discrete or continuous. In in uh, when we wrote out the the uh, elbow, right? So we intentionally used expectation here, and if Z was continuous then this summation will be an integral, right? We make no assumptions about Z being continuous or discrete in EM, right? So, uh, so back to where we were. So P of X, uh, we, want to we want to learn a model P of X so that we can do things like anomaly detection. This question? Yeah, so the question is, is, is K going to be learned automatically or is it going to be a hyperparameter? For the purposes of this lecture, assume it's a hyperparameter and you tune different values of K. Yes, question? Is Z defined differently if it's from a higher dimensional space or is there any other reason? Yeah, so, so this is, this is uh, the, uh, the, the assumptions that we are make, making over here are what is called as, you know, factor analysis. And there are there are uh, you know a few variants of factor analysis. In fact, so here we are assuming you know the the uh, uh, the psi matrix is diagonal and has you know different values on the diagonal. You can tweak you know that assumption to say there is you know equal uh, uh, there is there is uh, uh, equal noise in uh, along all the diagonals, um, and and you know that gives you a different model. Uh, you can make few other you know small little changes here, and that gives you something called as probabilistic PCA. This specific set of assumptions is called factor analysis. Why does Z have mean zero and 
Yeah, so that's just uh, you know an assumption that we are making. Yeah, that's so the assumption that z has mean zero and identity one is just an arbitrary assumption, and it turns out to be that you know it it is uh, most of the times that's that's good enough. Right. So the making an assumption that our x has mean zero and identity one would be you know absurd, right? But then we have this you know offset mu and you know uh, scaling l that we applied to z. So you know uh, it usually that that you know this this um, the, the the l and mu make up for the fact that we don't have any degrees of freedom here. So um, and now our goal is to using using uh, this set of assumptions, we want to maximize. Uh, we want to learn log p of x given mu l and psi. Right? How do we go about doing it? The answer is em. Right? And as I, as I as I uh, mentioned already, the the first thing to do in EM is to be clear on what the model is. Right? So the model that we have was described like this initially. So Z comes from normal zero identity and X given Z comes from normal mu plus lz and psi. We are now going to make this small change and rewrite this as an equivalent model z identity epsilon comes from zero psi and x is equal to mu plus l z plus epsilon. Yes, question? We'll we'll see why psi will uh, psi will not be sparse. We're going to work it out. Right. So um, right. So these two are basically equivalent. Are there any questions on why these two are equivalent or not? Right. Because we 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 will we will be using this trick again in in a couple of lectures. Are are you clear on why these two are equivalent? So this is basically called the the um, uh, scale and location property of of uh, Gaussians, where if you take you know some Gaussian, right, and um, so this basically follows from the fact that um, over here um, you can write x as uh, uh, you can decompose this into into two parts. So you can uh, x given c. Has this mu plus lz and and uh, sigma, so this basically uh, tells you that for this given mean, so think of this as the mean, and think of this as the covariance, right? So a normal distribution, if it has some mean and some uh, 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 covariance, you can write this as m plus normal distribution with some mean and some covariance right right so yeah so this is bad notation think of them as you are adding one one uh, a number to a random variable that's distributed according to that so uh, so assume uh, you know there is a random random variable 
which has mean m and uh, which, which is distributed normally according to mean m and uh, stand, you know, covariance s, right? This random variable can be written as the sum of a constant plus another random variable, right? So this uh, this other random variable has mean zero and, and, and standard error, right? So you're basically, you know, uh, doing essentially the same. So here the this is epsilon over here. Next question. So we, you know, for so x had you know mean. You know, I mean, you, you, you can see here, right? So this is just mu plus lz, and we just x mu plus lz plus epsilon. So covariance of x won't have any any contribution from uh, epsilon. Uh, sorry, from uh, z because x is mu plus lz. It will, but this is just x equals. You know, we, we haven't written the distribution of x here. Right? We, you can just rewrite x as as this thing. So, um, so this gives us, you know, using making this observation, we can now write out the model, you know, of z comma x. We'll have some joint mu z x and some covariance sigma. Right. So, what we're going to do for the next few minutes is to write out this model, right? And once we are clear about the model and clear about the different components, then we're gonna attack it using EM. So first, uh, as, 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 as we did it with the Gaussian mixer model, first we wanna be very clear about the model. What are the latent variables? What are the observed variables? What are our parameters, right? And it turns out that we can, so this um, uh, mu zx, We'll have two parts: a mean corresponding to z and a mean corresponding to x. Right? This is just the standard uh, multivariate Gaussian properties. We we saw such uh, we, we saw these properties using uh, when we were talking about Gaussian processes. Right? So this will correspond to the mean of z. So the mean of z is just zero. Right? And the mean of x. So the mean of x will be just. Um, so what will be the mean of x? Mean of x is equal to the mean of mu plus lz plus epsilon. This is equal to mu plus zero plus zero, so just mu, mu. So for the, for the joint probability distribution, p of x comma z is distributed according to a normal distribution whose mean is you know, zero mu. And the covariance so again the covariance will have four parts right so here we will have covariance of z covariance of covariance of x x z Z transpose and covariance of X, right? And it can be shown pretty straightforwardly that covariance of Z is just identity, right? And this will, the covariance of, of uh, The covariance of, or this, this this is so the covariance of x and e, uh, a covariance of uh, x and z, is basically by definition expectation of x minus expectation of x, z minus expectation of z transpose, and if you expand this out, this will just turn out to be L. Here you get L transpose, 
Uh, no, so this will be L transpose, this will be L, and here we get L L transpose plus psi. Right? So the 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 model or the or the joint probability of X and Z is going to be a normal distribution, a multivariate Gaussian distribution whose mean is given by uh, 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 you know 0 and mu and whose covariance is given by identity uh, L, L transpose, L, L transpose plus uh, psi. And the way you uh, arrive at these is by basically going with the definition of covariance of X and Z to be expectation of X minus expectation of X times Z minus expectation of Z transpose, right? And, and uh, similarly uh, for the expectation of X, uh, you do the same X minus expectation of X, X minus expectation tra uh, transpose and you will get these terms and the, the, you know the detailed steps are in the notes. But the, uh, but the, 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 uh, the higher level message that we want to take, uh, uh, take from this is given some, some data generating process, the first step that we did was to come up with uh, the uh, definition of the model. So the model in this case turned out to be X and Z are jointly multivariate Gaussian with a given, you know, with some particular mean and some particular covariance, right? So the model, right, that was our, our, our the, the first step that we want to do is P of X comma Z is such that X Z is jointly normal with mean 0 mu or Z X rather Z X uh, mu and covariance I L transpose L and L L transpose plus psi, right? So this is the, you know, the full model and the parameters, parameters are basically mu, L and psi, right? And in this, what have you, what do we observe? We observe, what is observed in this? X and the latent variable is Z. Yeah. So, parameters, evidence, latent variable, right? And now, to apply EM on this, in the E step, you want to calculate P of Z given X. Right? So in the E step, we attack the latent variables and in the M step, you want to do mu L sigma equals arg max of the elbow. Right? So this is, this is going to be the, the high level flow of what we are going to do next. Right? And this, this, this uh, recipe is the same for any kind of model on which or any kind of latent variable model that we want to solve using EM, right? First get clarity on the full model of, of the joint distribution, identify what are the parameters, what is the evidence, what is the latent variable and then figure out the E step and the M step where in the E step, cal, you know, uh, re-estimate the latent variables and in the M step, re-estimate the parameters. It so happens that in this, in the, in the, in the, in the factor analysis model, it so happens that because they are jointly Gaussian, you know, this is you know, a side note, right? We, we can actually write L of mu sigma Oops, not sigma. Right, sigma there? No. Yeah. Mu, L, and psi log 
p of x now using those parameters and using the marginalization property of of, uh, of gaussians this actually has you know you can you can write it out as um, um, you know um, x is actually distributed according to normal you know uh, we can just read off this it has normal mu and variance ll transpose sigma right mu ll transpose plus sigma right but now if you try to uh, perform maximum likelihood estimation and obtain expressions for these you cannot get a closed form expression right which is why uh, em kind of comes in, comes to our help here because uh, in in this case it so happens that log p of x you can actually write out you know it as 1 over you know 2 pi to the d by 2 and here l l transpose plus psi to the half exponent minus 1 half x minus mu transpose l l transpose plus psi inverse x minus mu right you can write it out like this but there is no closed form solution that you can that you can uh, uh, um, come up with for l's and l's and uh, psi you can try it out but you know you this cannot be solved uh, uh, using closed form so instead what we do is we we use factor analysis uh, i'm sorry yeah expectation maximization and with expectation maximization we actually do get closed form update steps for both the e step and m step though they are a bit tedious in terms of how complex the expressions look but it is you know pretty straightforward it's just tedious it's not tricky right so for em for factor analysis the first thing we want to uh, you know attack for the e step is calculate p of z given x p of z given x in this case both z and x are, are are jointly gaussian you know which is the best you can hope for right when uh, i'm, I'm going to just write out the the full model here so z z x normal zero mu and covariance this identity l transpose l l l transpose plus psi right so what is p of z given x you know looking at this we can just read it off right if you if you um, we did the same thing for in, in in gaussian processes where we calculated the the conditionals of gaussians right in this case um, in this case p of z given x will be z given x will have a normal distribution where the mean is given by l transpose l l transpose plus psi inverse x minus mu right so this is basically you know if if you if you uh, remember a b if they are jointly distributed as you know mu mu a mu b and some kind of a covariance sigma a square rho sigma a sigma b rho sigma a sigma b and rho sigma b square now uh a given b will be normal this basically we, we, you know i'm just i'm just uh, recapping what we had seen in the past a given b will be mu b or b minus mu b divided by sigma b you know get like the the obtain the the, the z value of 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 b times rho 
times sigma a that will be the mean and the covariance is, is like the uh, Schur complement right. So, it was um, sigma a square minus um, in this case, uh, uh, so this minus this times the inverse times this. So, it was rho square sigma a square right in case of a and b and this is basically uh, being done in the, in the multivariate case. So, it is basically the same thing, but with, with matrices instead of scalars right and uh, this will give us the uh, Schur complement that so that is uh, covariance will be I minus um, L transpose inverse of this LL transpose plus psi inverse times L. Right. So, this is the short complement right. and this is, is, is like calculate the, the uh, 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 z value. So, x minus mu divided by the, uh, the, the um, uh, covariance times um, uh, L transpose which is, is basically um, map it back to the, the variance of, of z. So, this is z given x, any questions on this? And now, once we have z given x, we basically are able to calculate set q i of z i to be normal with this mean and this values, right. So, that gives us our e step. In the e step, we are going to, we are going to hold the current estimates of the parameters fixed and calculate the posterior of z given x, right. In the m step, so in the m step, we want to do arg max of mu l psi of the elbow, right. So, sum over i equals 1 to n and now we will have an integral of over z i in place of the summation over k different clusters, we instead have an integral over, over the z space of log p of x i z i parameterized by mu l psi divided by oh, I missed q i of z i divided by q i of z i mu l psi equals this right. So, this is the m step. Now, there are a few observations we can make here. So, the first thing is that we are going to first think write, write it out as an expectation. Right, so the expectation makes it makes it easier to understand. So this is argmax mu l psi i equals one to n expectation where z i comes from q i of So, we are going to factor this into x given z times p of z and in the denominator we have q and there is a log. So, this will be log p of x given z plus log of z minus log of q i right. So, factor this into 2 and these 3 apply to log. So, you get log a plus log b minus log c right. So, this will be expectation of log p of x i given z i plus log p of z i minus log q i of z i right. So, this is the m step. Any questions on this? Yes, question. Q i 
Yes, so this integral and QI became the expectation. Good question. Right? So one thing that we can observe here is that in all, in any kind of an EM, uh, uh, whenever you apply EM, this part over here was is log P of Z. So this was the numerator and this was the denominator, right? So this is the denominator, that's log Q, log Q, and this is the numerator, right? In numerator, we factored out into two parts, right? In all, whenever you apply EM, no matter what the model is, you always have this denominator, Q, that does not have any of the parameters that you want to optimize, right? So the parameters that you want to optimize are always in the numerator, right? And there's a log. So which means in any given EM model, when we are performing argmax, we can just strike out this part. Not just in factor analysis or in Gaussian mixture model, whenever you apply EM, right, in the elbow, the denominator, because there is a log, log, uh, uh, log of this, uh, this ratio, the log of the denominator will never have the parameters that we are optimizing over. So you can always just strike out the, the uh, uh, log cube. Over here, specifically in the case of factor analysis, we make yet another observation that log P of Z also has no parameters because we assumed Z comes from, from a normal distribution of zero I, right? That also had no parameters, right? So in case of, of uh, factor analysis, we gain this additional cancellation of this P of Z as well, right? So now all we are left with is, so X given Z has, so what was X given Z? X given Z had a normal of, yeah, so this does have the, the uh, you know, this does have mu, L and psi, it has all three of them, right? It's parameterized by mu, L and Z. And so we are, we basically need to perform arg max of, of this term with respect to mu, L and Z. This question? Uh, we have not yet, we have not yet. And I'm not sure if we will have the time to uh, come till there yet, but uh, let's wrap up as much as we can. So, and now once, once we have uh, written out in this form, it is basically just calculus, right? Uh, it's, it's going to be, um, so log P of uh, X given Z can be, can be written out as, this can be written out as arg max of mu L, mu L psi, I equals one to N expectation of Z i from Q i of log one over two pi to the D by two psi one half exponent minus one half X i minus mu minus L Z I psi inverse X I minus mu L mu minus L Z I right and here if if you if you uh, if you basically you know just take the derivatives, set it equal to zero. Uh, in order to do that, uh, however, there is this expectation over here, right? So we have this expectation over this whole thing. So in order to take the expectation, we will now have to break this into smaller chunks. So this will be log of 
log of 1 over 2 pi to the d by 2 and this will be minus half log determinant of psi, log and the exponent will cancel minus 1 half x minus mu minus L v i psi inverse x minus mu minus L v i, right. You still have the i equals 1 to n expectation v i from q i, right. And now we can we can um, uh, we can see what terms depend on z and what do not. We are taking an argmax of an expectation of something, right? And so, this term does not have z, nor does it have any of the parameters. So this can just cancel out, right? This term does not have z, so it can come out of the expectation. This term does have z. And in, in order to perform the expectation, you will have to expand out, you know, distribute this multiplication uh, across all terms. And once we, once, we, uh, uh, once we do all that and you uh, take the gradients and set it equal to 0, we will get L is equal to sum over i equals 1 to n x i minus mu. times mu z given x transpose where mu z given x transpose was from the posterior right it's it's that big expression over here times summation i equals 1 to n mu z given x, mu z given x transpose, again this, this mu z given x is the full posterior that we derived earlier, plus sigma z given x, right. So this is the m step update for L and similarly the m step update for mu will be 1 over n i equals 1 to n x i, right. This should be pretty straightforward because we assumed, we, we gave z a 0 mean and x, you know, x therefore had to be, uh, uh, so mu therefore had to have uh, this, this mean. And then we calculate this phi matrix 1 over n i equals 1 to n. Oh boy, this is painful. X i, X i transpose minus X i mu z given X transpose L transpose minus L mu z given X, X i transpose plus L. I'm getting tired writing this mu z given x, mu z given x transpose plus sigma z given x times L transpose and it, psi i i equal to phi i i, right. So this is an intermediate computation and you take the diagonal values of this and set them equal to be um, uh, psi i i, right. So there is this uh, a lot of symbols, a lot of monstrous looking expressions. Um, I would not expect you to memorize this, right. Um, uh, however, the, the uh, larger story from this is the way we went about applying EM, the, the recipe of applying EM, we, uh, we obtained the, you know, we derived the, the E step. Um, as as uh, the simple posterior and in the m step we had to take this expectation with respect to z um, of of the the uh, of the of the elbow uh, so the elbow which is the expectation uh, with respect to z 
A crucial point uh, to note here is that in many places, if you if you you know search for EM algorithm on the, on on Google and try to learn about EM algorithm, in many places you might see an algorithm that's described like this, where in the E step, you know calculate expectation of Z, and in the M step, you know do org max of P of z comma expectation of z right you might see many many uh, uh, articles or, or documents that describe e step this way where e step corresponds to the expectation m step corresponds to maximization this recipe this 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 uh, uh, sequence of steps is true only sometimes right in simple models you can write it like this in gaussian mixture models you can write it like this Right? But the, the correct way to do expectation maximization is to have in the E step perform only calculation of the posterior and construction of the elbow and in the M step maximize the elbow. In simple models those two steps are equivalent to this but if you were to do this for more complex models it will be wrong. If you follow this step for factor analysis you will get it wrong. It works only for simple steps, but the, 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 the process that works for any model is in E step construct the posterior Q, uh, the, the Q distribution and in the M step maximize the elbow. That works all the time, no matter what. For simple models that is equivalent to this, but you know that is something to, to uh, 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 keep in your mind. Alright, with that we will uh, we'll break. If you have any questions, you know come up uh, to the stage and we can, we can uh, 